Namaskar. Good morning to all of you. On behalf of the Chief Justice of India and other judges of the Supreme Court, I extend a warm welcome to all the distinguished invitees to the second edition of the annual lecture series started by the Supreme Court of India last year to commemorate its Foundation Day. Your gracious presence here adds sanctity to this occasion. On this occasion, we are also deeply honoured by the august presence of Her Excellency Ms. Hilary Charlesworth, Judge, International Court of Justice, Dr. Justice D. Y. Chandrachur, Chief Justice of India, and Justice Surikant, Judge, Supreme Court of India. We are also immensely honoured to have with us Dr. Charles Guest, the better half of Her Excellency Ms. Hilary Charlesworth. May I now request May I now request Justice Surikant, Judge Supreme Court of India, to kindly deliver the welcome address. Dr. Justice T. Y. Chandrasur, Honorable Chief Justice of India, Justice Hilary Charlesworth, Honorable Judge, International Court of Justice, my esteemed brother and sister judges of the Supreme Court of India, Honorable Former Chief Justice of India, Honorable Former Judges of the Supreme Court of India, Chief Justices and Judges of the High Courts, Distinguished Ambassador and Officers of the Australian High Commission, Learned Attorney General for India, Dr. R. Venkat Ramani, Learned Solicitor General of India, Dr. Mehta, Chairpersons of various national tribunals, Law Officers of the Government of India, President Dr. Adi Sagarwala, other office bearers and members of the Supreme Court Bar Association, very distinguished team of senior advocates from the Supreme Court of India, esteemed audience who have joined us both in person and via virtual mode, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all a very pleasant morning. It is my proud privilege to welcome you all to the second Supreme Court of India annual lecture series which was initiated the preceding year. The objective behind the commencement of this series was imbued with twofold purpose. A. To commemorate the founding of the Supreme Court of India, and B. To cultivate a rich exchange of ideas between the Indian judiciary and our colleagues abroad. It aims to be a collaborative platform dedicated to the advancement of constitutional values. The first edition of this annual lecture series was graced by the presence of Chief Justice Sundresh Menon from the Supreme Court of Singapore who delivered an indelible lecture on the role of the judiciary in a changing world. I wish to apprise our distinguished guests from abroad that the Supreme Court of India first opened its majestic doors on 28th January 1950, just two days after the Constitution of India came into force on 26 January 1950. Since its very inception, the Apex Court has played a pivotal role in upholding the rule of law as a repository of ensuring justice for all and as a guardian of the constitutional morality. On the momentous occasion of this year's annual lecture, we are delighted to welcome Justice Hilary Charlesworth, Judge International Court of Justice, on behalf of the Supreme Court of India, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to Justice Charlesworth for graciously accepting our invitation despite your many demanding commitments. We are beholden to you for your august presence. Thank you, ma'am. Justice Charlesworth, adorned with a career marked by scholarly excellence and judicial dexterity, 
stands as a luminary figure in the realm of jurisprudence. He is a distinguished alumnus of the pre prestigious University of Melbourne and Harvard Law School, having attained her doctorate of juridical science from the latter. He is also a Fulbright scholar. Justice Charlesworth was decorated with the title of Laureate Professor at Melbourne University Law School and has also taught law at the Australian National University and the University of Adelaide among numerous other prominent institutions. I would like to add here that Justice Charlesworth is no stranger to India and this event is rather akin to homecoming for her as she previously taught at the Mayo College Azmer in the year 1976. We all welcome you heartily. It is noteworthy to mention that after qualifying professionally as a barrister and solicitor of the High Court of Australia, Justice Charlesworth was admitted to the bar at the Supreme Court of Victoria in 1981. While I have known of Justice Charlesworth's exalted work in an international law, from a judicial standpoint, what truly amazed me was the breadth and depth of her impact on jurisprudence to an extensive array of academic works. Her prolific output, encompassing numerous books, publications, articles, and even encyclopedias are testimonies to her unparalleled dedication to advancing legal scholarship and shaping global legal principles. Her book, which she co-authored, titled the Boundaries of International Law, a Feminist Analysis, was awarded with the Certificate of Merit by the American Society of International Law. We are surely fortunate to have such an eminent legal luminary with us today. Justice Charlesworth, since assuming her position on the International Court of Justice in 2021, has continued her illustrious journey underscored by remarkable achievements. Upon her election to the ICJ, Harvard Law School professor David W. Kennedy, who first met Justice Charlesworth during her graduate studies, said, and I quote, Hilary Charlesworth is one of the most innovative international lawyers and original voices in the field of international law in the last generation. I express my deep admiration for Justice Charlesworth's remarkable contributions to the land, legal landscape, particularly in her involvement as an ad hoc judge in the ICJ, in pivotal cases such as Guyana v. Venezuela, which centered on an arbitral award and the notable whaling case Australia v. Japan. Justice Charlesworth's contribution in the field of international law have also earned her widespread acclaim. Her erudition and expertise have illuminated countless legal debates and enriched the global discourse on matters of utmost significance. As one of the select few women to be elected as a permanent judge in the ICJ's 78-year-old history, the presence of Justice Charlesworth in the International Court of Justice heralds a new era characterized by inclusivity and diversity. Furthermore. Justice Charlesworth has admirably assumed the role of a great mentor to numerous aspiring professionals and scholars within the sphere of international law, notably prioritizing support for women. Her dedication to fostering the next generation of legal minds exemplifies her commitment to diversity and empowerment within the legal community. The audience will be delighted to know that our own Chief Justice of India, Dr. D.Y. Chandrasud, and Justice Charlesworth pursued their doctorate degrees in the same years at the Harvard Law School. It's a pleasure to have these two internationally renowned jurists grace this dais together. This year, on the 28th of January, the Supreme Court of India marked the beginning of its Diamond Jubilee year and stands poised at the threshold of a new age characterized by heightened collaborations with judicial counterparts from across the globe. This concerted effort 
is aimed at not only disseminating our cherished values but also encouraging a meaningful exchange of best practices by engaging in fruitful dialogue and forging long term partnerships the supreme court of india endeavors to nurture a shared understanding while embracing the varied perspectives that embellish our collective pursuit of justice commitment of supreme court of india to prioritize the rule of law and value the significance of human rights needs no emphasis the apex court has consistently demonstrated a nuanced understanding of global progress in the human rights discourse and legal frameworks and has not only upheld the tenets of the indian constitution but also enhanced the broader international conversation on justice and rights its judicial pronouncements resonate universally impacting judicial doctrines and acknowledging emerging rights across jurisdictions today's lecture marks a continuation of supreme court of india's steadfast determination to initiating global dialogues on justice through the invitation extended to distinguished jurists from around the world we aspire to facilitate open and candid discussions on various issues confronting our justice systems we are eagerly anticipating justice charles's illuminating insights as he delves into the topic the international court of justice a legal form in a political environment as we know the international court of justice being the principal judicial autonomous organ of the united nations is a promising platform for the nation states to seek redress and uphold the rule of law on the global stage the international court faces unique challenges in upholding its judicial independence and impartiality in the constantly evolving political arena how this court manages to sail through troubled waters is quite interesting the words of wisdom of justice charles worth will surely make us understand how they untangle the inner knots of these intricacies with her extensive experience as a judge of icj and her proficiency in international law both as an academic scholar and a jurist we look forward to gleaning invaluable overview that will undoubtedly enhance our understanding and refine our thoughts on this pertinent subject matter with these few words i once again thanks and convey a very welcome to each and every one of you to this great event thank you very much thank you sir i would now like to call upon dr justice d y chandrachur chief justice of india to kindly share his thoughts with us very distinguished guest and speaker for today justice hillary charlesworth judge of the court of justice my colleagues judges of the supreme court of india former chief justices of india former judges of the supreme court of india, the dignity of this function by gracing this chief justices of the high courts attorney general for india general of india president and secretary of the supreme court bar association focus on court association senior counsel telling just charles worth more women senior advocates who have been designated in one lot than we had over 75 years of our history wishing wish yes members of the bar all the invite first and foremost i must share a little secret with for 600 plus audience that we have this to all of you us but the secret i want to share with you is that we have a birthday boy in our midst happy birthday to justice surya kant it is indeed a moment of honor for me to join brother justice surya kant and all of you in welcoming to the supreme court justice hillary charlesworth 
a judge of the International Court of Justice, an esteemed scholar, a pioneering feminist thinker, and most importantly, a dear old friend. Now, I have in my text of the speech put old into inverted commas for the simple reason that what I say about Hillary applies to me in equal measure as well. And I'm not prepared as yet to accept that the phrase applies to me. But when I say, dear old friend, I really mean that we go back a long way in time. Uh, Hillary Charlesworth and I forged a strong and enduring bond throughout our academic journey at Harvard Law School, where we were students for the LLM class of 1983 and pursued our doctoral studies leading up to the SJD together. We both completed our Doctor of Juridical Science in 1986. We discovered common interests and values that solidified our friendship. We attended classes and seminars together, engaging in meaningful conversations about law and philosophy. Our friendship extended beyond the classroom as we spent our formative years discovering Cambridge. Harvard Law School's academic rigor posed a formidable challenge, yet our friendship provided invaluable support, easing the journey as we navigated to the demanding curriculum. On a lighter vein, there is a quote by Charles Morgan, a British playwright, that I often think about when I look back at my days at Harvard Law School. And Charles Morgan said, if Moses had gone to Harvard Law School and spent years working on the hill, he would have written the Ten Commandments with three exceptions, the savings clause. In a movie which is based on Harvard, which is very close to my heart, I've watched it several times, called The Paper Chase. The last scene of The Paper Chase is when these graduating students at Harvard Law School make paper rockets out of their marks, teeth, the degree certificates, and then let them into the wind to flow into the breeze. I think that's, I never realized the importance of that until I was reflecting on it again this morning. And I believe what it really tells us is that in this great equalizer of life and the profession, our birthmarks surely, but surely erased. Hillary attended, like me, Lawrence Stripe's course in constitutional law, and she was the only person in the class who got an A plus from Lawrence Stripe. Stripe became her supervisor for the SJD. As students of the SJD program, we had the best perquisite available on display at Harvard, which was we had offices of our own, all overlooking the beautiful greens. We also played our own version of the Davis Cup together at Harvard Law School. We had, as Hillary always said, a team comprising of players from Australia, India, Ethiopia, and New Zealand. But the standout image that remains etched in my memory is of Hillary on a bicycle. The little attachment to carry the groceries or to put the days, we didn't have laptops in those, put the days working material. That reminds me always that truly, Hillary wears her scholarship and erudition with a badge of truly the sign of a great human. A pleasure in welcoming her spouse, Dr. Kali Guest, as well. And before I move on to a little, be a little more formal uh, part of my speech, I must conclude the first part, the more personal part, which a little anecdote, which I am sure you'd forgive me for sharing, personal note. She has two children, Stephanie, Steph, and Will. And Will was extremely, and still is, very fond of cricket. So when the Indian cricket team went to Australia, she took special permission from the Indian High Commissioner uh, so that little Will could go and meet the Indian cricket team at the reception for which she was invited. A couple of days later, Hillary spoke to me and said, uh, you know, there's something very interesting that happened. And he just refused to go and brush. That night, when I told him as a young child, you have to go and brush and then be done for the day. 
He refused to touch. Asked him, touching. So he had met Sachin Tendulkar and shook hands with him. He says, you don't brush and wet your hands after you have spoken to God and shaken hands with God. <laughs> well, so much for so much two personal things. Last year, to celebrate the legacy of the Supreme Court, we instituted an annual lecture commemorating the momentous occasion of its first sitting on 28 January 1950. For the first edition, we were honored to host Justice Sundaresh Menon, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Singapore. This year marks a special year. It is a momentous occasion in the history of the Supreme Court and our nation. The Supreme Court of India has entered the 75th year of its inception. No one better than a judge and a scholar with years of experience and a profound understanding of the law could aptly capture the significance of this milestone. Thank you for graciously accepting our invitation, Justice Charlesworth. At Harvard, Justice Charlesworth worked on her dissertation on constitutional law from a North American and Australian perspective, while I labored over my work on affirmative action in India in the context of comparative law and jurisprudence. As we both toiled over our dissertations, we engaged with the law, but were also compelled to navigate the dichotomous yet intricate relationship between the law and politics. The theme Judge Charlesworth has selected for her lecture today, International Court of Justice, a legal forum in a political environment, is to say the least interesting and topical. It is, of course, of contemporary relevance in view of the unprecedented growth in the docket of contentious cases before the International Court of Justice. Notably, however, the theme for today's lecture also reflects a question that is fundamental to the law and legal systems, both domestic and international. The International Court of Justice held its opening session on 18 April 1946, a time when approximately a third of the world's population including Indians, lived under colonial rule or in non-self-governing territory. As the International Court of Justice celebrated 75 years of its inception in, 19, in 2021, its then president, Joan Donoghue, recognized that there has been a significant change in the composition of the court since its inception, which has impacted the functioning of the court and the diversity of cases which it is called upon to adjudicate. Today, there are 193 United Nations member states. The existence of a diverse member states community has had a tangible influence in the kind of cases that the ICJ is faced with today. It no longer deals with only questions of convention or border dispute or whaling. Not only has there been an increase in the number of cases brought before the court, the subject matter of the cases has also seen a sea change. Various nations are calling on the court to determine issues of human rights, including questions about the Genocide Convention, so recently, and the Convention on Torture. In this way, the change in global politics has been crucial in shaping the transformation of the ICJ as well. It reflects the deep interplay between politics, power, and the law. Similarly, the institution of the Supreme Court of India in 1950, which we have gathered to commemorate, was also a moment that marked political and social transformation. It cannot be viewed, our founding moment cannot be viewed as divorced from the political realities of its time. The sitting of the Supreme Court for the first time echoed the aspirations of a nascent country, burdened by the legacy of colonial rule and entrenched social stratification, yet equipped with a transformative, progressive, foresighted constitution. Over the years, the Supreme Court has embodied these aspirations by crafting a vast body of jurisprudence aimed at liberating India from its colonial past and fostering the groundwork for social transformation. In this journey, the apex court of the nation has emerged as a product of the interplay between the polity, societal aspiration, and the law. At this moment, it is important to emphasize that diversity and representation is crucial not only for rectifying historical injustices, but also for enriching the decision-making capacity of our courts. The evolving representation of nation-states before the ICJ 
has notably challenged its historically monocultural and Eurocentric outlook. Likewise, integrating gender diversity within the courts would substantially broaden the spectrum of perspectives, leading to more comprehensive and equitable decisions. In her book, Boundaries of the Law, Justice Charlesworth notes that in 1999, when she completed writing the first edition, international law was in a period of renaissance, marked by the end of the Cold War between the West and the Soviet bloc, the dismantling of the Berlin Wall in 1989, which appeared to have freed international law from its political shackles. The United Nations Security Council had begun to create new institutions and adopt new thematic agendas, such as the protection of civilians and children in armed conflict. Yet, there are times that the new world order, as she tells us, may not necessarily improve the lives of women. She says, Widespread violence against civilians, including violence targeting women and girls, accompanied the new wars and ethno-nationalisms in, among others, Somalia, Rwanda, Haiti, and the Balkans. The rise in the trafficking in women and girls with opening of borders between Eastern and Western Europe, she says, and the deployment of peacekeeping troops, the increasing prominence of fundamentalist religious groups, commitment to neoliberal economic ordering, and inequalities and violence accompanying the free market zones but other signs that patterns of systemic oppression of women and girls would continue in the post-Cold War era. Then the book speaks about feminism, particularly in the context of international law. Quotes Professor Sandra Friedman, a distinguished professor at Oxford, that what is ultimately feminism mean in the context of constitutional or international jurisprudence? It means four things. First, the redress of disadvantage, which may require re redistributive measures. Second, recognition of the prejudice, stereotyping, and violence that are caused by inequality. The third aspect is ensuring the participation of people in decisions that affect them. And fourth, the achievement of structural or transformative change, which is the fourth dimension of quality. I mention these four because we as judges and lawyers are constantly grappling with these ideas, not only in the context of feminist jurisprudence, but in terms of justice to our own marginalized. There is the scheduled caste, the scheduled tribes, the other backward classes, so many other groups in our society. Therefore, from that perspective, I must, at the end, Shared that the first woman to be elected to the International Court of Justice was Dame Rosalind Higgins, who was also the first female president of the court. Judge Charlesworth is regarded as one of the pioneers of the feminist approach to international law and has brought this school of thought into the mainstream. She was the fifth woman to serve, she is the fifth woman to serve on the ICJ in the court's 77-year history. Recently, Judge Julia Sebutende, the first African woman to sit on the ICJ, has been elected as a vice president. To have more women as judges of the ICJ is not the responsibility of the court alone, but a share of the responsibility must be borne by nation states and national groups who are responsible for the nomination process. I dare say the same in regard to the appointment of more women judicial officers in India as well. I was reading that in October last year, the ICJ amended, among other documents, its rules of courts and practice directions to make their provisions gender inclusive. The Supreme Court of India has also made strides in this regard. The Supreme Court released a sensitization module for the judiciary on the LGBTQIA community, which seeks to sensitize members of the judiciary on concepts of gender and sexual diversity, on the usage of appropriate terminologies, and make recommendations on the protocol to be followed by courts while interacting with the members of the queer community. Similarly, the Supreme Court recently released a handbook to combat gender stereotypes, in an attempt to ensure that judges use inclusive language and consciously avoid the use of stereotypes in decision making. Before 2024, only 12 women had been bestowed with the title of senior advocate throughout the entire history of the Supreme Court. However, recently, there was a significant shift 
at the Supreme Court designated an equal number of women hailing from various regions across the country as senior advocates. They will be the torchbearers of change, the future of the legal profession in our society. There was once a notion of law which limited us to merely an isolated arena from society. Today, legal fora across the globe are recognizing that they cannot view themselves as divorced from the socio-political realities and aspirations of the time. This recognition fosters an environment conducive to mutual learning and exchange of ideas. I'm hopeful that the lawyers and researchers whom we mentor today, and so many of our law researchers are part of the audience, are going to change the way in the legal systems, the way the legal systems have been working. The new generation of lawyers and scholars are evolving new paradigms to reimagine the conceptions of law and justice. I'm optimistic that the interaction with Judge Charlesworth will not only benefit the Supreme Court of India to learn from and engage with the International Court of Justice in the years ahead, but will inspire the young minds in the audience to reflect on finding solutions to the numerous challenges affecting the globe at our time. I once again extend my gratitude to Judge Charlesworth for gracing the Supreme Court of India with her presence. I warmly welcome her to India. Now I yield the floor to her for the highly anticipated lecture. Thank you, sir. Your address was indeed a treasure trove of wisdom garnered and gathered through experience and wide reading. With this, I request the Honorable Chief Justice, Dr. Justice D.Y. Chandrachur, to present a memento to our esteemed Chief Guest. It is time now to hear our chief guest for the day, Her Excellency, Ms. Hilary Charlesworth, whose exceptional body of work in the areas of international human rights and international humanitarian law, feminist legal theory, and gender equality has not only shaped the academic discourse, but also shed light on the complexities and nuances of myriad forms of discrimination. Through her work, she has challenged the deeply ingrained societal norms and highlighted the urgent need for transformational change by dismantling oppressive structures. Through her work, she has opened places of inclusivity and empowerment. With this, I request our erudite chief guest to kindly address this August gathering who are so eager to hear from her. Chief Justice, General, very distinguished present judges of colleagues, friends, uh, Mahmoud, he push who he aaj muhe yaha aapji. <laughs> Indeed, a really great honor to have been invited to deliver the second lecture to celebrate the anniversary of the foundation. And I'm very conscious of the 75th anniversary. Very, very grateful for Justice. As he's already told you, Met 40 years ago, since at Harvard Law, and I still recall us nervously together, Professor Tribe's course on American Constitution Law, and both terrified, fall on us, prompt you, and uh, was a very bonding experience. But we spent these wonderful uh, years at Harvard together, exploring all the rich. So you will not be surprised. 
surprised that the Chief Justice stood out even as an absolutely brilliant, but also for me, generous. And allow me to say that my family and I, our French family, hope it will continue. Allow me also at the start to thank the staff of the court and the room graciously making all the arrangements. Until perhaps I've long had fascination with India after studying Indian art and history at university. And then as a student, as you've heard, that I, I did hear uh, you'll be perhaps shocked to hear geography and hockey, of all things, at Mayo College in Ajmi. But exploring India that first year, that was my first year and had a travel a lot, was really a profoundly life changing experience for me. I visited, and I have to say, it's just wonderful, vibrant. I, I have been wondering since I received this what thoughts I can offer this very distinct audience. And I, I did have the good fortune of reading last year's speech by the noting that he was able to draw long so members. So I hope, given that I can't give you many lessons from my long career, much said it might be a if you world of uh, international particularly focusing on the one that I I know, of course, that over the years, the Supreme Court of India has manifested an interest in the work of the Indian Unlike many other constitutions, the Indian Constitution acknowledges the role of law in Article 51, part of the directive. And the Supreme Court of India has, of course, regularly referred to and indeed on occasions Indeed, I've been struck uh, that it is much open to invoking another apex, such as my own, uh, the High Court of Australia. What I, I would like to say is to start with describing the structure of And then I, I want to discuss how it navigates its role as a legal institution, deeply divided environment that implicates. Of course, the International Court of Justice's structure and jurisdiction are quite different from those of a national court, such as I hope that you some of our experience resonate. Well, the origins of the court uh, are, okay, uh, date back to the early part of the 20th century. And you can see here an image of the Hague Peace Conference Participants in 1890 gathered on the of what's now the residence, the house tent posh, just outside the Hague. So there were two Hague pieces, 1899 and 1907, both initiated by uh, Nicholas. And those two conferences together resulted in the establishment of the institutional structure for interpretation. And this is the permanent court of arbitration. Uh, but an arbitral court is not a judicial institution. There were moves in the early 20th international. And this permanent court was housed in the same building, the palace or uh, in the Hay. And I've, I've got, this is a picture here of the inauguration of that building the front with the white beard, thunder of the Scottish-American philanthropist Andrew Carnegie on the opening. So the first occupant was from the court, but it was then forced to provide half of the for the. So the permanent court was inaugurated in, and indeed in that year, it with three requests for advisory that had come. In its life, it took the permanent court delivered judgments in 29 cases. 
between states and it rendered 27 advice. And its last public was in 1930, just after the outbreak of This is an image of the formerly the last meeting took place because of the war that was the right uh, this is the image of the court it were disbanding itself in five I should say some of those judges immediately became judges of Seth court international so the new court the international court of justice established under the that we inherited a statute almost identical to and adopted. Even today, uh, our court operates, many of which uh, were first devised. Uh, the International Court, however, distinct from the Permanent Court of was elevated to the status of a principal institution at the same level. Pretty well, as for our structure, this, I should say, this is the first, this is the opening of the International Court of Justice that we're hearing. Perhaps in the front row of the audience, you then young of the Netherlands on to, of course, a long standing inaugural judges. Well, this is the latest, what we call the family photo. I should say. Court uh, had a new composition Tuesday. So this is the court in its composition. But as of Tuesday, we lost four of our colleagues, including our, our president, Judge John Hewitt. But this shows you uh, one photo I got from all the judges, uh, all the old composition. So the court is composed of 15 judges required to be. And judges are elected by the United Nations generally in the United States, voting simultaneously. And judges are elected for nine years. Court statute, and I quote from it, mandates representation of the main form and of the world. And how that's translated in practice, that requirement is observed in an informal regional allocation. There has also been a tradition that this was so un uh, when famously uh, lost in the most recent last year, uh, Russia lost it. So there are three now uh, still. So we can't really refer to that long standing. The statute doesn't refer to gender representation, unlike, for example, the Rome Statute of. And I think overall the internet all record are in attention balance. Almost eight decades, six women have been, while 109 men. Today, uh, with uh, our president, Joan Don, very can So, uh, you will be aware that a former member of the Supreme Court of India, Judge Dalbia Bandari, we, we call judge at the court, I'm aware that he was justice here. Judge Bandari at the moment, the current member. The distinguished judges from India B.N. Rao, one of the architects on the value of the he was elected to the court in sadly died uh, before he uh, perhaps the longest serving Indian jurist that Judge Indra Singh sat on the court for 15 years uh, in the 1970s he also vice president as president, he presided over perhaps one of the most significant cases in the Nicaragua case. Back to um, every day, I walk past this statue of 
uh, Nagendra Singh, Judge Nagendra Singh, because if you were president at the court, you were allowed to choose either a sculpture or a portrait. And so sculptures are displayed in the judge's wings. So I, I feel, although of course, but I feel um, I see Judge Nagendra today with this extended, extended bronze. Another Indian judge of the court, uh, Ragnandan Patak, was appointed when he elected to the court when he was justice of the court. And he finished Nagendra's uh, after Nagendra Singh's death. In the court invariably sits with all of its 50 members. Uh, the statute of the court, it's true, contemplates the formation of specialist force presence at the discretion of the court to constitute all a bit. So almost invariably composition. If there's no judge of the nationality of a that state may appoint so in some cases seventy in three out of the India courts eight there was no Indian judge bench, and so various were appointed. One was uh, the former Chief Justice of Bombay High Court, Douglas, who was a top judge in rights of passage case brought by Portugal in late 19th. Uh, judge Nagendra Singh, uh, he was also before his election to the in a case India brought against Pakistan dating to the and Supreme Court Justice BP Jeevan Reddy was appointed ad hoc judge in a case that Pakistan aerial so that's the membership of the what about in its contentious jurisdiction Court deals only with unlike the international court, we never see individuals touch court. They never uh, for us as it all a hundred and nine members. That doesn't necessarily they accept. There was some discussion whether the court should have compulsory during the drafting of. And in that position, the court having compulsory was certainly a champion of all the states, such as Australia and New York. But ultimately, the Soviet Union and the United Kingdom failed. That was. There are three distinct ways to come before. First of all, it's possible for states to enter into Special agreement. We have a nice one such case socket, and this is where the neighbors uh, Guatemala and it. That's one route. That's in fact easiest route because one knows they'll. But a second route, when both states grants the I just and uh, examples of such treaties that have such a jurisdiction clause include the genocide. Or that was precisely Article Nine of the Genocide Convention, invoked by South Africa in its recent. There is the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Uh, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms. So the court at the moment has a number of cases that are based on such. There are two brought against Russia but on the basis of a range of. There's uh, a well-known case that Gambia brought against. On I can. There are cases as a based on the racial and a case brought by Canada. And 
Austria based on second method. The third method by which states manifest making a standing debt, accepting the compulsory just over a third of the done this. And uh, Australia, my country of national, has and of course also has exports. Uh, I do note, however, no other member of BRICS. And strikingly, only one of the permanent members of the United Kingdom such a declaration. Most recent declaration, August. Many of these declarations, however, are in the court. So to give you an example, Australia's current all married and for its Indian declaration, which was revised in 2000, includes 11 categories, including disputes with states that or have been, and I'm quoting, disputes in regard to matters. Like the Permanent Court of International Justice, the International Court also has an advisory whereby certain UN organs requested by the critical words in the Charter are. And this image is Lagos. This represents the most recent advisory rendered by the court on status. So, uh, the registrar sitting right of the then judge. But this is an image of the International Court hearing uh, the court's arguments, very famous as repeated on the Western side. Uh, in its 78 years, the uh, International Court has did 182 and delivered seven. What of enforcement? Unlike national, some other international uh, international court of justice is not involved in the implementation uh, its binding judgment. So once the court delivers its judgment, so the enforcement of the court's decision states them first and foremost the parties. United Nations Charter includes an undertaking all UN quote here article nine. Undertake by with any case. And Article 94 goes on to provide that a party to a satisfy the party's performance of its obligations and judgment and have recourse. And the council, under the same article, is given the power to quote from it, make recommendations, and upon. However, what's Hiking security council Now, how can we explain this? Of course, the use of the veto by one of the and really a me that route. Indeed, in one case, the United States used its power uh, any action by the security affect the enforcement of with in the end, the implementation was delivered in nine. Really, was resolved by a broader negotiations package many years. Ago. So the means and modalities for very independent, and they can involve the regional or international, including. So one example of this implementation supports this in an interesting way resolved a dispute and a maritime boundary dispute in So the court gave its decision in 2000 and then there was a lot of dispute between 
also issued writing on this, um, about how actually judgment. And uh, the Secretary General uh, recommended, using his good officer's function, recommended that the states establish a commission for the judgment. This commission, and here is an example of the commission, uh, looking at a boundary mark. And this commission, which is made up of experts, both of the chaired by a special representative, and it also has a subcommission. And each year, the secretary uh, makes a report to the security council progress on the council agenda every year. But uh, it is slowly, if one follows the reports, we can see it slowly, the judgment is slowly being implemented. Um, at, least, at least it's being implemented. Other judgments are more straightforward and states are generally willing to I think no state welcomes being found acted in. For example, almost two years ago to the day, the court awarded $325 million United States dollars in favour of the Democratic Republic of the Damages caused by Uganda involved significant violations of rights law and the laws of the turn of our most century. It's at least reported in the press that Uganda has been complying with the judgment by paying the compensation. So it seems that uh, despite the limited apparatus of a they nevertheless often have considerable influence. In many ways, the legitimacy of the court depend on the confidence that the members of international constituents, states and international organizations, confidence they have in it, uh, which in turn turns on its basic form. I must acknowledge that there have been in the longest lean period Perhaps was the period after the delivery of the judge, the Southwest Africa case. <clears throat> and this is an image. <clears throat> the court, after it heard uh, the hearing, it had 16 judges in, in that case. Judge, um, the court was evenly divided on the Ethiopia area, two members, African. Did those two states have standing to challenge South Africa's mandatory Southwest Africa modern day? Uh, the, those two states, Ethiopia and Liberia, argue that South Africa's extension of its Africa was inconsistent with the League of Nations. So, because there were 16 judges and the vote was eight, the vote was and under our rule, the president of the court, who's here, in fact, uh, this is Percy Spender, uh, the first Australian elected to the court, uh, president of the court. Here he is announcing the court's decision, and he cast his casting vote against Ethiopia and Liberia. <clears throat> Many of the new members of the United Nations developing were dismayed by this decision, lost trust in them as a forum. That distrust was deep, lingered for 20 years, really until the court's 1986 decision in Nicaragua against the United States. And that, the Nicaragua case, as I've mentioned, was actually decided under the presidency of Judge Nick. Today, despite that low point uh, in the court's history in the 20 years when there was barely a case on the court's docket and some judges found themselves becoming elected to the court and simply never hearing a case on the court because there was such loss of faith in the court. But we are at one of the busiest points ever. After just speaking beforehand to the Chief Justice, I'm embarrassed to tell you about the size of our docket after hearing about the size of the docket of the Supreme Court. Uh, but this is the biggest uh, docket ever. Uh, we have 18 contentious cases from every region of the globe. 
The cases uh, range from land and maritime boundary disputes to, as I've mentioned, allegations of race discrimination and genocide. We received last year two requests for advisory opinions from the United Nations General Assembly, one on the legal consequences <coughs> excuse me, of, <coughs> of Israel's policies and practices in the occupied Palestinian territory, and we're just about to begin hearings in that case. And the second one was on the international legal obligations in relation to climate change. And then in September, the International Labour Organization requested from the court an urgent advisory opinion on whether one of its conventions enshrines the right to strike. So for the court, this is a historic number of cases to have on its docket at one time. And it does suggest at the international level, the court has a groundswell of respect and authority in the international community. Perhaps paradoxically, deep international political divisions that have hampered diplomacy in the work of the Security Council appear to have made the court more appealing as a forum for dispute resolution. And yet, despite this apparent success, the court has also attracted a great deal of criticism over the years. One strand of criticism that I'll, I'll focus on now is that international law operates in an intensely political context and that its principles are more the product of politics than true law. On this argument, international judges are often taken out of the purely legal realm and they're called on to make political decisions. This criticism isn't peculiar, of course, to international law. In several domestic jurisdictions, including Australia, it's sometimes argued that the courts, especially the appellate courts, should keep at arm's length a category of questions that are incapable of legal decision, questions that are deemed non-justiciable. Then, as now, uh, international adjudication has always been premised on the consent of sovereign states. Agreeing to submit their disputes to a third party arbiter. So the argument in international law runs that some disputes are politically sensitive and the disputes touching on the vital interests, or sometimes it's called the honor of the state, are simply too important to be left in the hands of international judges. So the idea is that the role for courts, such as the international court, uh, that they should simply occupy themselves with technical cases, such as land and maritime boundary disputes. But what's technical and what's an issue of policy? The inherently subjective, if not self-judging character of that sort of argument is evident. But beyond that, the argument rests on a purported distinction between the realm of politics and the realm of law. Politics and law are not different provinces of social organization. Rather, I see them as different lenses through which to observe social experience. And so every relationship, including every conflict between states, can be approached through a legal perspective much as every relationship and conflict between individuals can. As with relationships between individuals, it may be more or less useful to approach a given relationship between states through a legal lens. That doesn't make it impossible, nor inevitably futile. Of course, this isn't to say that law can provide the only angle on a relationship. Being one of multiple lenses, law will hardly ever offer a perfect image but it provides an important thread in a fabric of regulation that can be woven with threads of politics, economy, history, public opinion, and culture to influence behavior. In its practice, the International Court has affirmed that it may indeed, it must decide the legal aspects of disputes that are properly submitted to it. And it has held that any dispute framed in legal terms is essentially illegal. <laughs> The court articulated that idea unequivocally for the first time in a case arising in the wake of the Iranian Revolution of 1979 and uh, in the siege of the US Embassy in So with its nationals still taken hostage, the United States resorted to the court, complaining that Iran was breaching the inviolability of diplomatic premises and the immunity of diplomatic and consular staff. Iran responded in turn that this act should be seen against the United States' decade-long interventionist policy in Iran's domestic affairs. 
So even though the relations between the two states were extremely tense, the court did not shy away from this dispute, and it held that its constitutive instruments did not contemplate, and I quote from the court's judgment, decline to take cognizance of one aspect of this merely because that dispute has other aspects however important. Of course, sometimes uh, that decision has been explained as simply a political move by a Western-leaning court then presided over by a British judge. After all, it said this was the same court that had fairly recently decided uh, not to grant Ethiopia and Liberia standing in the Southwest Africa. Yet it was not long after the case by the United States against Iran that the court applied exactly the same principle against the United States itself. Uh, the Caribbean country, the Central American country of Nicaragua, bought a case in 1984 against the United States, complaining about its interventionist policies, um, its funding of, of guerrilla groups and so on uh, in that country. And uh, the United States, when it was brought by the court before, uh, before it, uh, the United States made the argument that uh, the court should not rule on this case. Intensely, it's a case that's susceptible only to political resolution, one that's not susceptible to legal resolution. And indeed, the United States argued it would be counterproductive to the political resolution of the dispute between the parties if the court gave an opinion in the matter. Well, the court gave very short shrift to the United States argument, acting consistently with its uh, decision. And here is uh, Judge Nagendra Singh uh, presiding in that case. And uh, the court said that its role was to decide legal questions, even if they form part of a broader political dispute. In 2017, India found itself in a situation comparable to that of the United States in its case against Iran, or Nicaragua in its case against the United States. Uh, Kulbushan Sudhir Jadav, an Indian national, uh, had been sentenced to death by a Pakistani military court on counts of espionage and terrorism. So here is a, a picture of the Indian team uh, in the Great Hall of Justice. And India relied on the same convention that the United States had in its case against Iran, the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. Um, and uh, India claimed that Mr. Jadav was denied his right to consular assistance by its state of nationality, and the court uh, certainly agreed with that argument. Now, of course, it, it's obvious that the court's judgment didn't resolve all tensions between India and Pakistan, but at least it provided a resolution, a legal resolution, to an acute problem dividing them. So let me then uh, move on to independence of judges. The political context in which the International Court of Justice inevitably operates, because we are the United Nations primary judicial, this gives rise to a second form of criticism that uh, relates to the independence of judges. Popular commentary on the court, and here you can see, this is the photo actually of the court taken just last Monday as uh, we were swearing, uh, the, the uh, new colleagues were making a, a declarations, their solemn declarations, and temporarily the president of the court was the most senior judge on the court, Judge Peter Tomka, uh, who in his third term on the court, Judge Tomka is from Slovakia. So that's, that's, that's the court, I say, in its, its new composition. But there's, there's a lot of uh, commentary on the court that often presents it, especially in the popular media, as an almost entirely political organ whose members effectively represent the interests of their states of national. The nationally and legally heterogeneous backgrounds of the judges are assumed to make judicial consensus unlikely. And in this respect, many commentators contrast the ICJ unfavorably with national courts, which are taken to represent the acme of the judicial function. On this analysis, the international court has at best the carapace of a court, offering, however, a highly restricted form of judicial independence. So I cite as an example the American academic Eric Posner, writing in 2006, and uh, he concluded in a famous article on the topic that uh, the International Court of Justice was basically lost because it could ne neither please the major powers, which resisted any constraint on their actions, nor could it maintain the loyalty of smaller powers, 
which in his words regarded the court as a puppet of the major powers. Well, uh, Eric Posner and other scholars have studied the voting behaviour of international judges, focusing on the extent of their independence from the state that nominated them and drawing very pessimistic conclusions, basically saying uh, judges will always vote in favour of the interests of the state, of their state of nationality. The decision in the Nicaragua case uh, in 1986, it's very interesting in the literature, as soon as that case appeared, there was a flurry of claims by mainly United States lawyers, academics, that the members of the International Court weren't independent. And uh, promptly, before the court went on to hear the merits of the Nicaragua case, the United States withdrew its statement of jurisdiction. So, and it said, well, the reason why the United States has done so is because the court essentially is not composed of independent. <clears throat> Such scholars have gone on to explain the reluctance of some states to appear, for your, to appear before the court as based on a lack of trust in an international judiciary to apply the law impartially, assuming always that the judge is going to vote in favour of positions that promote the interests of their home states or that reflect their own cultural prejudices. So the question of judicial independence is one that confronts all courts and is vital to their legitimacy. It is of, of acute importance in a global era of democratic decay and growing autocracy. And I, I was very struck by the fact that Chief Justice Chandra Chud emphasised the centrality of judicial in his wonderful address that he gave at the ceremonial sitting of the court uh, just two weeks ago. But what does uh, in judicial independence mean in an international context? And what I struck in preparing for this talk is how little reflection there is on this question in the scholarly literature. So students of international law, this would be a wonderful question for a PhD thesis. The court statute describes the court, and I quote, as a body of independent judges elected regardless of their nationality from among persons of high moral character and legal competence. And the new judges, and you can see them actually standing to make their solemn declarations in this photo, uh, they, the solemn declaration is one to perform their duties and exercise their powers as judge. The four words are honorably, faithfully, impartially, and impartially, and conscientiously. And so there are several provisions in the court's institutional framework that seek to preserve the impartiality of judges. That is, their absence of bias in favor of one party. So, for example, the court statute forbids judges to participate in cases in which they've previously been involved in a different capacity, such as counsel for one of the parties. On occasion, this principle has been applied very rigorous, rigorously. For example, uh, B.N. Rao, uh, the distinguished uh, Indian jurist who I mentioned earlier, was the Indian ambassador in the Security Council at the time it was called on by the United Kingdom to consider whether Iran was failing to comply with an interim injunction or a provisional measure that the court had issued in a pending case between the UK and Iraq. When B.N. Rao then was elected to the court shortly afterwards in 1951, he decided himself that he should not participate in the court's deliberations in subsequent phases of the case between the two countries. So he clearly had a, a very high standard there of, of impartiality. But I see independence as different from impartiality. It's aimed at eliminating not any preconception that judges may have, which I take to be impartiality, but rather any non-legal considerations that might affect a judge's reasoning and cloud their judgment. Independence as freedom from any source of extra legal pressure is a trait to be ensured not only by each judge individually, but also by the judicial institution as a collective. At the same time, of course, guarantees of independence must not shield judges from accountability. And that's often a, a, a fine balance. In this regard, we can see in the International Court of Justice's basic documents rules that are frequently found in domestic and international judiciary. The incompatibility of the judicial function with any other profession, notably political or administrative function, uh, the impossibility of removing a judge, save by unanimous decision and judicial. The value of other rules and practices in safeguarding judicial independence is less obvious, and it may sometimes depend on a domestic legal heritage. On this point, 
an international institution such as the International Court of Justice brings to the fore various and potentially diverging, indeed clashing conceptions of independence, and it tries to accommodate them. Take, for example, the rule concerning the secrecy of deliberations and voting. It's fairly uncontroversial in most systems that judicial deliberation should be secret. But what about voting? Our court, the International Court statute, is silent. To a common lawyer, it may seem obvious that the judgment could indeed should indicate the way in which each individual judge voted in the operative clause of the court decision. Uh, the fact that the International Court statute explicitly gives judges the right to append individual opinions seems to point in the same direction. But on the other hand, it's been argued, <clears throat> especially by those from a civil law tradition, that to identify the individual judges' votes not only undermines the authority of the judgment, but that it also exposes those judges to real or perceived pressure to vote in a particular way. For more than 50 years, the practice of the ICJ and its predecessor was not to indicate the way in which each judge voted. And it was only in 1978 that the court amended its rules so that now its decisions also indicate the names of the judges' constitutional authority. All of these guarantees may indeed protect a judge from immediate attempts at manipulating them. But there are, of course, more subtle forms of influence. For example, there are no limits to re-election at the International Court of Justice. So a judge who's facing re-election in the near future may, theoretically, be tempted to modify her views to align them with influential elector states. For that reason, several judges, including the recently retired president of the court, Joan Donoghue, have proposed a single non-renewable term for International Court of Justice judges. She suggested in her recent address to the Sixth Committee of the General Assembly, perhaps there could be a single term, a single term of perhaps 12 rather than nine years. Non-renewable terms are already the rule in various other international courts, and they've been recommended by the Institute of International Law, the oldest learner society. Of Such a reform would, of course, require amendment of the court's statute, which is not in the hands of the court itself. Nonetheless, the court has adopted a series of decisions, as well as some informal practices that set limits to the invitations or decorations that judges may receive into their participation in external activity, in arbitrations, and so on. Uh, to conclude then, assertions of lack of independence are regularly made about judges who staff international, international judicial institutions such as the International Court of Justice. Almost all disputes and requests that arrive at the court have a clear political context, and some observers are keen to question the court's ability resolve such issues on the basis of law. And yet, uh, in my view, I think the court has largely overall managed to adjudicate the legal aspects of politically sensitive disputes with integrity. Judicial independence is critical to the operation of legal institutions, particularly in volatile political contexts such as the international sphere. But its content is not easy to pin down. At the international level, where a diversity of judicial backgrounds is vital, judicial independence, the idea of judicial independence, must accommodate intellectual, social, cultural, national differences. I think it's important to develop more sophisticated accounts of judicial independence than simply tracking vote patterns, with all due respect to those who engage in that research. The United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Independence of Judges and Lawyers has recently identified some current challenges to judicial independence in national legal systems that I think apply also <clears throat> in, to the international level. These include these challenges include disinformation that's spread online, online harassment and threat, and also the misuse of artificial intelligence. The special rapporteur also emphasizes the composition of the judiciary as a critical element of judicial independence, noting who words the importance of participation in the judiciary articulated for those who commonly experience discrimination, uh, including women, members of minority groups marginalized, for example, because of their ethnicity, race, or sexuality, or persons with disabilities. I think judicial independence is a field where the international judiciary, of which I'm a member, 
has much to learn from the practice of national courts. Our two courts, the Supreme Court of India and the International Court of Justice, while very different, I note that we're of a very similar age. You're going into your 75th year, uh, we're going into our 78th year. Slightly, slightly off there. But we both face the task of navigating highly charged political environments as legal institutions. The international judiciary, I think, can draw inspiration from the Supreme Court of India's distinguished history of independence and innovation. What is also really impressive to me is the Supreme Court's courageous capacity for introspection, which, uh, to quote the Chief Justice's recent talk at the uh, ceremonial sitting, and I quote from him, introspection is the art of bringing the seemingly unattainable in the line of vision. This, it seems to me, is a vital quality section for true judicial independence. Chief Justice, let me congratulate the Supreme Court on its Foundation Day, on its uh, anniversary year, and I wish it a rich and rewarding Aap, uh, Aap Sabika Ahod Danyavad. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Your words are a reminder that through judicial independence, we can bend the arc of history towards a more inclusive and equitable future. We owe a debt of gratitude to you, ma'am. With this, we come to the end of the second edition of the annual lecture series of the Supreme Court of India. I would like to thank the honorable guests both on and off the dais for sparing their valuable time on a beautiful Saturday morning. With this, we conclude. I request all of you to kindly join us for lunch after this program. Thank you.